now everyone who travels, especially at this day and age, it's about the storytelling that I went here and I did this. I was able to enjoy this and this property did this for me. It's no longer the same cookie cutter brand of we got in, this is how the room looked and that was it and I checked out. That's no longer, to my mind, at least an acceptable norm if you're trying to be different in the industry. Hello and welcome to The Modern Hotel. You're presented by Stay Flexi, your all-in-one modern operating system for independent hotels. Each episode, we'll get to know an industry expert and we'll discuss the latest trends in hospitality to help you, The Modern Hotelier. Welcome to The Modern Hotelier presented by Stay Flexi. I'm your host, David Malilli. And I'm Steve Karen. Steve, who do we have on the program today? David, today we have on GB Sharma. I'm excited to have GB on. GB moved up the ranks at Highgate for 15 years. He became the CRO of the Impulsive Group, and now he's the Executive Vice President at EOS Hospitality in New York. Welcome to the show, GB. Thank you, Steve. Hi, David. First off, let me just say what an awesome effort you both are doing across life to share this knowledge and the insights via Modern Hotelier and by running this podcast. Greater to Thanks, join GB. Here. Yeah, thank you. So we're going to go through three parts of the the podcast. The first part, we're going to get to know you a little bit better. We're then going to ask you some get some information about your career, the history there, and then we're going to dive into some industry topics. So we also have a little bit of a surprise at the end of the questions that we we ask you. So we're just going to dive right in and uh, go for it. So what was your first job ever? Oh wow. My first job was at Bethany College in West Virginia. I was flipping the most awesome chicken burgers with curly fries. <laughs> what, what do you think you'd be doing if you were not in hospitality? You know, when I came to America, I majored in the field of political science and communications. I wanted to work for the Foreign Ministry of India at the UN. September 11 happened, the criteria changed, and I kind of got lucky to come back to the hotel industry or just enter the hotel industry. Otherwise, I would likely be working at the Foreign Ministry of India. Good. So this question, we know we could have an entire show around, but what's the weirdest thing you've seen or the weirdest story somebody's told you that of something that's happened at a hotel? Oh my God, like this would need to be a PG-18 forecast. Like, you know, I'll skip that question. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, a lot of people do skip it, but we, we still, we're, we're pulling. We, we figure if we get enough good answers, we'll just have a whole podcast on that. Was there somebody that you admired when you were growing up? Yeah, like my father and mother, they sacrificed so much to raise like two crazy, crazy kids. Like my brother and I were probably the most mischievous kids. So hats off to them. If you could take anyone dead or alive to lunch, who would it be? That's a good one. I would probably say dead Robin Williams. I mean, Ooh. like the kind of person he was, I mean, Good Morning Vietnam, Dead Poets Society, Jumanji, Aladdin, Green. Yeah. I mean, absolutely awesome. So I would probably say Robin Williams. Great That's answer. funny we just we just cleaned up and I was looking for it behind me, but I saw Robin Williams and I got an autograph, went backstage and got an autographed a photo and I just I forgot that I had that photo, but I was cleaning up and found it and it was so it was eerie because it was right. He just had would have been 71. So it was I found the photograph right around his uh, what would have been his birthday. But that's well, a good one. Well, David, I'm guessing that's the surprise you have for me towards the end of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what I can do. If you want to change your name to David, you're, you're in good shape. What's the best piece of advice you've received? Actually, from one of the ladies who I looked up as a mentor early on when I started in the hotel industry, it was often about hey, Gaurav or GB, go do this, go do this, go do this. And you kind of become a yes man to a lot of different things as you grow in your career. And she kind of pulled me aside and said, hey, someone told me this and she passed it to me was, I cannot give you the formula to success, but I can give you the formula to failure. And that's to please everyone, right? So you right. just need to learn to say no. And that to me was very powerful. Wow. That's good advice. Well, now tell us something that's on your bucket list. It's so crazy. I would love to be chasing a tornado. Like go watch the storm chasers oh. and go chase a tornado or go for bungee jumping. Like cool. like to Macau. Wow. They have the yeah, they have the longest, I believe. What is it, like seven hundred feet or something that you can just jump down? So yeah. that would be awesome. So you want to push the limits of being alive? Yes. <laughs> and not be one of the folks that you say, Who would you want to have lunch or dinner with dead? Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a this is a good uh, segue to this question. What scares you? You know, blind spots. I would say blind spots. And by 
blind spots, I would say, not just in scope of when you see it when you're driving, but also in your own work. Like oftentimes we take a lot of things for granted and those kind of become your blind spots over a period of time. So I look at blind spots very carefully. Wow. What's something you wish you were better at? If you would ask my wife, she would probably <laughs> say you need to go to the gym more. Right. <laughs> and if you ask me, I've been designed to say that she is always right. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. That's good. All right. So that's good. So this is uh, it's another good segue. So you're doing a good job leading me into the next question. So if you could be a superhero, who would you rather be? Superman, Batman, or Spider-Man? You got to pick one of the three. I would probably go with Superman. Don't ask me why. Ask me why. <laughs> All right. That's no problem. All right. So now we have a part. This is where we, we sneak something in. So we are going to play a quick round of Family Feud. Uh, the final part of Family Feud. I'm going to ask you three questions. If you get the number one answer on each question, we'll donate $100 to the charity of your choice. If you're familiar how it is, I'm going to ask you a question. You tell me what you think the number one answer is that people respond, and we'll take it from there. Got it? Okay. All right, good. Yeah. Here we go. We're going to give you about 20 seconds, uh, and Steve's going to mark down your answers. So if you could go to the Land of Oz, what would you ask the wizard for? What are my options? You have to just pick. You have oh to my just God, throw, really? throw out whatever you think. I will skip that question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Name something a snowman might have nightmares about. <laughs> Oh my God. Sunshine? Okay. That's a good one. Name a type of insurance. Geico. Uh, not a brand, an actual type. Like Car covering insurance. something. Car uh, let's go let's go back so we get fair. So just think about it. what if there's you go to the, the, the Wizard of Oz and you can ask him for one thing. What would you ask him for? Can I have his superpowers? Okay. That's good. Yep. Okay. That's a hard one. That is a hard All right. one. <laughs> All right. So we'll go back. So we'll start with the first one. So the the wizard, the question, the number one answer people that were surveyed asked for was money, but magic power was on there. Money was 37. Magic power was four and to fly. So it goes with your Superman thing. The name something a snowman might have nightmares about. You got the number one answer there. That was sun, beach, weather. So that's that's there. And then name a type of insurance. And number one answer was car. Number two, health. So we will still donate. We'll get a charity. We'll still donate $50 to a charity of your choice. But that was just a little fun we like to have before you start getting into some more of the serious questions. Yeah. So now we'll kind of get to know you a little bit more, where your background is, how it shaped you and things like that. So, so where did you grow up? You grew up in India, correct? That is right, Steve. I grew up in India. I came to America right after my boarding school. So I was in Bombay till the age of 14. Cool. I went to a boarding school in South India for four years. That's a very interesting story, sideways. And then right after that, got a scholarship and was able to come to America. Went to West Virginia to do my bachelor's, followed by University of New York to do my master's. How did, how did growing up in India shape you to, to the person you are today? A lot of, I believe, you know, when you see it, there's a lot of competition, right? When you see it growing up over here, there's a different narrative of you getting a 95% score versus a 98% score. So the pressure there is tremendous because you may have 50 people ahead of you between the 95th ranking and the 98th ranking. So the pressure is kind of ingrained in you sure. that you kind of work a lot out of fear as a child that, oh my God, I'm not good enough. I got 94, 95. Versus here, it is very different where there's yeah. a source of encouragement to say, we won't even publish rates. I mean, our scores were written on the board, so it was public knowledge for everyone to see. And, wow. and if you did poor, I mean, you went home, first your grandparents were upset at you, then your parents are <laughs> upset at you, your teachers are already upset at you. So it was just three strikes, right? So yeah. I mean, the pressure was very different. In one way, it shaped us to be a lot ahead of the curve in a lot sure. of things. So you kind of like absorbed a lot more. So the transition to coming to America was a lot easier. In one way, especially when it came to education or really being focused or to taking a disciplined approach, call it. So that kind of helped a lot as a foundation growing there. That's the other side of it. But that was really ingrained in us as a child. 
Sure. And, and you mentioned your secondary school you went to. They're pretty well known for their football team. Is that correct? Oh, my God. I mean, I can talk to you about like the St. Joseph's or I can talk to you about Bethany. I mean, across the board. Yes. Yeah. St. Joseph's, I believe their nickname is uh, the sporting giant of uh, Nilgris. Is that correct? No, Nilgiri. So we Nilgris. call ourselves. Josephites, yeah, we call ourselves the Josephites, and there's a whole song to it. I was a very horrible goalkeeper, but it made, like I made it to the team, so that was great. You all had to pick a sport. I picked the one where I had to stay in my place, but it worked out okay for a while. That's great. I actually was a goalie all growing up too, and I just didn't want to run, so I just was a goalie. So <laughs> we're in the same boat. That's pretty cool. So what made you decide to go to Bethany College? Good question, David. So... Talking about the sports side, one of the sports, we had to take sports in the boarding school. I was like, my body was not made to run. So I landed up picking up a sport that I thought was somewhere I could stay in one place. And that was rifle shooting. Mm -hmm. Now, little bit I realized that rifle shooting is all about breathing. And it's your breathing exercise and that requires very stable heartbeat. So you run. But once you're in it, you're committed to it. So for four years practice, 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 you became good at it. And eventually it reached a point that you could get sponsored for the same thing. So part of the scholarship came from the education side and part of it also through your sports academics. And I was able to get a scholarship and Bethany College was the one, was the only college I applied to and I got it. Wow. You kind of already answered this one, but we're going to ask you it anyway. So you majored in international political communication at Bethany. And then you went on and, and at the City College of New York and international communication. And you had mentioned earlier that, you know, as far as being in the political side, was that the driving force behind you going for studying those topics? Yeah, it was a subject like it was quite an orthodox subject back home because no one really studied in college to go into politics in India. Right. So that was something that you wanted to be the disruptor. You wanted to be the one that brings change and you're speaking through a trajectory of education, right? So studying politics was very important to me, like just seeing growing up on what was happening back home. And I believe the best way you could make an impact was in foreign affairs. So that kind of got me into thinking, hey, that would be a very interesting way for me and also to utilize what I believe were my skills. Unfortunately, post September 11, a lot of things changed. I was an international student, hiring was a freeze, things were very different. So I got lucky to get into an internship in a hotel and that changed my trajectory of growth forever. Did you get in the hospitality world right after college or did you do something else after college? So I started it in my junior year of bachelor's. Oh, and awesome. Then, and while I came here, I did the first internship and thereafter I got asked to come back. So I came back right after graduation and then did evening college to get my master's while in the daytime I worked at our properties in New York. Very cool. So that was that was your first job in, in hospitality was while you were still in college, you were working at the hotel. Yeah, we were building the very cool website for the Radisson Lexington, which was 99% HTML, where it was all static, but we got an award back then because we were able to put in one simple JavaScript that allowed the picture to rotate. But that (laughs) did take five to 10 seconds. But it was so disruptive back then that it was like it won the award of what a cool website it was. Wow, Wow. that's awesome. So from there, did you go to Highgate? Or did you do stuff in between and, and, and figure it out? But I know you were at Highgate for about 15 years, right? Yeah, so Highgate was actually only one hotel back in 2003. Yeah. Highgate were only the Radisson Lexington Hotel. And from there, in 2004, is when they acquired the Metropolitan New York, which became the Double Tree, and thereafter the Park Central. So Highgate really started to grow at the same time. So I joined them kind of right at the early start of their own growth. Then in 2008, as Highgate was expanding on the West Coast, I was able to move with the company to the West Coast to take over their portfolio on the West Coast. Very cool. And you were the VP of Revenue and Distribution for Florida and the Caribbeans, correct? Was there something about Highgate that really helped enable you grow your career there? Or what about Highgate, really? You were there for 15 years. What made you stay there for that long? Yeah, I think it comes down to the people, the people you work for and the people you get to mentor. Right? That, like, that to me is very close to my heart. 
and Heidi had, had that level of leadership mm -hmm. that really was very disruptive early on in the world of revenue management, in the world of commercial strategies, and also very disciplined in that approach. So that was the kind of learnings that you always aspired. In our world, we call it, hey, how do we chase from being good to being excellent? And that was always a chase that the bar was always very high. And it was quite different back then that it was not the norm, but we were trying to create a new norm. So that was very cool. And I think that kind of just kept us growing throughout. So going to the West Coast, taking over my first hotel as a director of revenue there, growing from there to an area director, then slowly taking on more properties, and then eventually to a regional direct, to a regional VP and then to a VP. And as the portfolios expanded, we then started to grow in South Florida, where I was able to come and also oversee the portfolio of their hotels between South Florida, between uh, Key West and Miami. And we had just opened up our first property in the Caribbeans as a AC Marriott. Very cool. Did you work with uh, Kerry Mack? Yes, yes, of course. Like Kerry Mack, phenomenal, phenomenal human being, like so smart. I got to work with her when it's like a bunch of others at the company. Yes. Yeah, that's great. What really kind of you think drew you to the revenue management side, really what kind of got you passionate about that side of the business versus other, other areas? That's a good question, David. For me, it was just the data was very sexy to me. Like, right. I'm, <laughs> I'm just seeing that it was kind of a rush that you wanted at that stage because it's not that you were making tremendous money. I mean, working in the hotel industry at that early stage and working in a companies where revenue management is not as known was very different. So you were chasing something that was outside the norm. When you can hold a 20% occupancy in a market like New York two days before that date, and you know 80% will pick up when the entire market is sold out, the rush you get from it and the excitement you get, I mean, you cannot put it in words. But, and then you repeat, and then you figure out new places where you could do that, or you figure out a way of, man, the market runs 40%, but you have the ability to chase it to 80%. And what went behind it, there's a level of excitement. It's a passion. You have to be passionate about it. And to my lens, it's an art. You enjoy it, you like you truly will, but it's not cut for everyone. Yeah, it's funny. It's kind of almost like you're calling plays in a football game, trying to figure out how to beat <laughs> the competition. And I love the the old timers that tell the stories that, one of the ways they used to do revenue management was drive by their competitor's hotel and count how many cars were in the parking lot to try to figure out what the <laughs> occupancy was. So Absolutely. I think that's yeah. pretty interesting. So so tell us, so you, you went from Highgate to the Impulsive Group to EOS, and maybe people aren't familiar with EOS. Tell us about the, the company. Just give us some insight there. Sure. So EOS now, as a stand, it's, it's about just 40 plus hotels with about 37 of those hotels being in the drive leisure resorts. EOS began in 2017. Our founder was Jonathan Wong, who felt that there was an opportunity to bring investors closer to hotel operations and those operators closer to the investment rationale. So it was all about making an impact that foundationally turned into our competitive advantage in bringing those trends together. And it allowed us to make more thoughtful investments through EOS investors. And then managing with an ownership mindset came to us as EOS hospitality. So it's kind of broken in two parts. Our first hotel was the Hamilton Hotel in Washington, D.C. in uh, 2017. Yeah. And over the past five years, we had that tremendous growth on the EOS hospitality. Now we're seeing that same portfolio of those 40 plus hotels, many of which are owned and managed by EOS and some of it also now into that third party. We started building out our management offerings last year and we are so proud now that we managed these three hotels in Florida Keys for some of the other owners. I used to live in DC for about eight years. So familiar with the Hamilton and it's it's such an awesome property. So I, I love that you guys work with that, work with them. What are you focused on? You're the executive pr vice president at EOS. What is your main focus there? Overall, but we look at the themes of what EOS is all about and what our culture that we are trying to drive. People are the most important part of our business. And the part of our magic is how we build that team that's genuinely kind people and the culture is positive and it's filled with collaboration. And we have the reputation now in the market of really recruiting some of the best people in the industry. Sure. On our side, it now comes down to 
if, if you look at it from a lens of a director of revenue, if we hire, do they do the basic three things right? Do they understand the market phenomenally well sure. and sure. have the ability to truly impact it and stay ahead of the curve? Do they have the ability to work around the different systems that you have so many different technologies right. to work with? And do they have the ability to work around the system versus just say, hey, the brand tells me to do this, so I do this. Right. And then number three, the big focus for us is to really build our own credibility in the market as EOS because we are a new company. Sure. But with that, we have been able to gain over the last five years. How do you mutually leverage each other in terms of, hey, what is you relying for your growth versus what we are? And how do we partner up so we can get to those results? So that part of the coaching takes a lot of, while you also emphasize on the talent growth and the bench strength that you're always working towards. Sure. And how has how has your your day to day changed? Like you used to be solely focused on the revenue side of things, and now you know your role has obviously expanded. Like how has that just changed your your day to day? Yeah. So as you grow as a company, I think we grew very fast into 2020 and 2021. So this year is more about a reset year for us, where we really tried to grasp everything that we have done over the last call it two years and three years, and really take a disciplined approach of what is the prioritization that we need to do now in order to be ready to scale when EOS gets to 150 assets or 200 assets and what is this that's required? So really focusing on systems, on system automations. Do we have the right people? What is it that we need to do? Are we missing something that we are not looking at? Do what we talked about, our own blind spots. That's what we are more focused on and really empowering our team to make the calls. On that note, I'll just share one thing too. Within EOS, we hold our GMs as the CEOs of their hotels. So we really defer to them on those calls in terms of what needs to be done on the property side. So really to empower them, to coach them the right way to that. What does it mean to be a CEO? What are the tools that they require? And is there something that if you're missing, we need to continue to train them or educate them on? That's what we are there to provide. So you've grown quite a bit in the in the hospitality space. Have did you have a mentor throughout this whole process from when you just getting started into hotels and now being a executive vice president at all? I do, I do. Early on, like you have different mentors at different stages in your life on who you look up to, but I believe consistently it's been a couple like between Kuri and Jacob and uh, Lakshana Jane who both worked much early on at the Radisson Lexington who I worked under. I've always been someone that I've looked up to. It allows me to always stay, one, humble, always hungry to learn, but also at the same time to say, what's next? What are we really aspiring to be? Because the best thing we look for in our own team is we expect our teams to do things better than us and faster than us, right? Because if they have the ability to do so, we know our company is in the right trajectory and you're going to do phenomenally well. But if they don't have the ability to keep up, then we know that we may go through a level of stagnation. So that's what keeps that drive going for me. And equally, we could share the same with our own teams. I'll give you a quick story. So I had a company called Open Hospitality, which was web development booking engine. I was selling into KJ maybe 2006. And um, they were using Unirez. And my company had been partners with Pegasus, which owned Unirez. And I presented my offering. And the time, I think, because of the number of hotels, we said, oh, we'll charge you X amount of percent of a booking. And he looked at me and he said, well, why would I pay you that when I could just go have people build it in India? And I was thinking, wow, I'm like, I wonder if he's going to do that. And then you left the meeting and then like two years later, it's like Highgate invest into Travel Tripper and they built the, a complete competitor. And it was it was just very funny. But I actually you know, spoke to KJ the other day. He's, he's a really smart guy. And uh, I bumped into him a couple of times at the Independent Lodging Congress, which We've had some people on that show. So talking about, you know, you have mentors, people that have helped you. Obviously, you've been around. We've both been around a while. What's one trait that you commonly see that successful people have that work around you? Well, I believe at least like, to my mind, it's always chasing growth. And like you want to continue building on your own bench strength. And to my mind, it always comes down to your next generation of talent. Because if you want to leave a good legacy behind, for the next company to grow forward, you want to make sure to what we spoke to was the next generation has to always do things better than you and faster than you, right? So they have to get to pick up those trends. If it took you an X amount of time to do something, can they do it faster? And can they jump onto it and 
and can they multitask? Those are the things that we always look for because that to us is a success in our head that I don't have to rely on something and my team can do it way better than I can. That to me is an ultimate success measure. So now we're going to move into the last part of the podcast, and that's more along the industry trends, getting to know, you know, seeing your, your thoughts on a few things. For somebody who's just starting out in hospitality, what would be uh, a piece of advice you would give them? I think the trends change so much, right? Like right yeah. now, you're just coming out of a pandemic. The narrative is everyone's working from home and it's okay to work from home. Like when you went through the crisis about, say, about 12 years ago, when you went through 2008 crash and 2009, the mindset was very different because what's happening is you see the industry going towards, oh, the inflation is so high and there's a potential recession. Travel is on fire, right? So there's always a need for labor. There is always a need for more people. So as you're getting into it, know what paths that you're going. Because in hospitality, you have many different paths that you could take. One, if you're chasing stability and you're chasing something, hey, I want a job for the rest of my life and I want something that I can enjoy doing. You have fronts where you could go into in the world of hotels and you could be stable. You could be working at the front desk. You could be working at so many different places and that gives you the stability also, whether you're in a union or a non-union environment. If you're chasing to say, hey, I want to chase knowledge and continued learnings and I want to continue to thought, you have thoughts like those too, where your first five or 10 years may be a struggle where you're going through either the world of revenue management or you're going through critical analysis or you're going into data mining, et cetera. Like, like you could have a path in that front. And if you're chasing to say, hey, I want to try something. I love talking to people. I love being out there. Sales and marketing is for you because one, at four, you right. can understand right the systems and you have the ability to understand the property, but you can relate it and you can connect the dots to what a customer wants, to what the hotel has the ability to offer. So you have the ability to connect those dots. But dependent on where you are in your career and what will make you happy, I believe those are probably one of the three options that will suggest them. That's a great answer. Very holistic. Well done. So we see on, on LinkedIn a lot, a lot, everyone's talking, has been talking, maybe not as much now, but COVID, labor shortages. Besides COVID and labor shortages, what what should we be talking about that we're not talking about in the industry? Automation. Automation to me is probably the lowest hanging fruit and also one of the toughest ones that you would say that it takes a lot of effort from the hotel and partners on both fronts to get there. And then if you're going into more deeper and saying, hey, what is probably important four or five years from now, you always wish you could do it sooner. But the reality is sustainability, right? In terms of how do you stay more and more like in a eco kind of a sense, right? So when we see it on that side, when we look at all the different arms, at least from my world, you look at PMS, CRS, CRM, CRO, RMS, BI, I mean, all of these sides, you're looking to see what is the harmony across all the systems? Where does the data live? How are you looking for to say, if I need to access something in a journey of a guest, whether it be in one property or multiple properties, you have the ability to do so by really stitching all the data together. So it's easy for us to comprehend. That's more of the back end side. Mm-hmm. On the front end side, it comes to technology of what are you doing for the guests on a digital experience and what we call it as e commerce for experiential e commerce, right? That what is it that you're doing? Because that's the storytelling, right? Now, everyone who travels, especially at this day and age, It's about the storytelling that I went here and I did this. I was able to enjoy this and this property did this for me. It's no longer the same cookie cutter brand of we got in, this is how the room looked and that was it and I checked out. That's no longer, to my mind, at least an acceptable norm if you're trying to be different in the industry, right? So you have to drive that sense of the experience on the property and then what are you doing from our side to constantly capture those eyeballs, right? In terms of marketing to them. And ROIs are so different now because first it was, hey, I want to get this person. I want to get it. Hey, can I spend 5000 and can you give me a 10 or a 15 to 1 ROI? Great. And that was the entire conversation. Now through social media, you look at it as a long-term attribution that, yes, we have to constantly target them. We have to constantly keep them engaged. And over a period of time, they will convert and that's okay. 
And and you kind of talked about this a little bit as far as, you know, that digital experience of the guests, but what are some of the best ways that either you've seen or you could recommend to hotels about increasing their revenue through utilizing technology? Yeah, the thing in our industry, the best thing we can do is learn from each other because our industry is relatively not the forefront of technology, but we are more of the copycat adopters of technology, right? So you see airlines do it well, you see apparel do it well, food and beverage do it well, but that's also because they live in an ecosystem of an app-based environment where all the data can all live in harmony with one another. In the world of hotels, Unfortunately, it cannot be done because you have got so many different hotels, right? You have so many different level of rooms and so many different ownership companies. So everyone is working in its own micro. So how do you stitch it all together? To us, what we believe is it starts from the discovery stage of the guest all the way to the time that you actually check out from the property and how are you touching the guest. Oftentimes you see hotels, you are there to give the warm welcome, but the guests, when they check out, they just leave. Right. So in terms of how you touch the guest from start to end to us is very important. And what are the things that you're plugging in A, to either drive the experience, to drive ancillary revenues to your properties, or to be in touch with the guests that, hey, are you okay? Are there things that you're missing that you need to do better? Are there things that you need that we could help you with? Are you sure that you have like, are there more towels you require? Or is there more reservations you need? Do you know that we have a concierge? Here's a link to all our activities for this week, all of it, right, that we over communicate in a period of time where we know staffing is a challenge. So we have to use technology to offset those, but also making it a point that we don't turn our phone hotels into vending machines where everything is at a touch of a button and there's an absence of human element. Right. Yeah. And I think it's a question of just, like you had said, the balance and, and to kind of remove the fear because a lot of hoteliers are you know, I, I go back to a, a company I was talking to that was a texting platform and the sales person was telling me, oh, hotels want, you know, personalized messages going back to the guest. But I was arguing, well, how can you personalize what's the Wi-Fi password or what time is checkout, <laughs> things of that nature. But I think sometimes hotels are afraid that that technology is going to, you know, somehow diminish the guest experience when it can actually, I think, improve it in many cases. Absolutely. And I think a lot of this also then does really come down, David, to how you connect the dots. For example, the same texting platform should have the ability to talk to your CRM as well, that we had a communication with the same exact guest two years ago, a year ago, and they constantly asked us for about the king size rooms or the corner rooms, but that wasn't the text platform. The text platform at this stage is not connected to a CRM. So to right. that CRM, let's say whether you use Sendine or you're using Revenate, for example, does that speak to Revenate? Unless you're using a Revenate CRM, the other one might not. So all the data, wow. and they own Navis. So when you pick up the phone and you call, yep. does my agent know everything that you actually chatted through to understand that this was the behavior, this is what they required, this is what was important to them, so we can address it in advance, then reinventing the cycle of, let me ask you the same questions all over again. <laughs> yeah. They must have been listening to you because I was an advisor to go moment when they sold to Revenate. And so that is their concept is getting that that information to this, the CRM. So what trend has, have you seen that you think is here to stay or going to be more prevalent in hospitality? I think you could see it by market segment. For example, whether you look at it as a third party channel or you're looking at it from how are you driving results to brand.com or to your own call center, or you're seeing it as corporate travel. You could see it in a lot of different ways. If you see it for corporate travel, I believe the emphasis will be more on the leisure travel as more and more people have the ability to work from home. Do they also consolidate personal trips? Do they have longer length of stays now where the first two or three nights are for business, but the rest for the one or two is in addition to their families and extending it into the weekends? Is it to do also that it's not for transit corporate travel, but business group travel that comes in and actually becomes a leisure where they actually come with their families and do land up staying longer? On a transient front, like to my mind, best rate guarantees, et cetera, are meaningless at this stage, simply because of the fact that you have the ability to geo-target. You have the ability to show member pricing in different places at different times. So what you may see, Steve, on your computer to what I target myself, to what I target to David, we all can be seeing three different rates for the exact same room type, right? So with every company out there, 
on a third party channel, giving you points and racking up points, that to my mind will also change. Like it will gamify it a lot more going into the out years that what do independent hotels do to keep up with the loyalties, to keep up with points. It doesn't need to be points that are tied to them, but I think that aspect will turn a lot more simply because people may not be loyal to a brand and they choose to stay with independence. They're probably a lot more loyal to an airline. So is it airline miles that soon tend to merge a lot more as an open API to us that we could give miles? Or does it come down to more and more credit card companies that start to open up a lot more in terms of points that we have easy access into to double down on those? But that to me would probably change a lot more in the coming years versus being at the point of, hey, you need to offer the best rate on your website, get this one and call it a day, and that will just drive you more direct bookings. Is there any organization you know that you've either worked with in the past or any that you're working with now that you'd like to kind of talk about or promote a little bit more? I wouldn't say promote, but I can definitely talk about it, right? That I think COVID was a period of us testing ourselves and also testing partnerships, right? So a lot of the partnerships that we had in place then also went through really tough times, right? So sure. that kind of like, to me, like I see it as iron, right? It's forged in fire. So to us also, we see like partnerships are best formed at the time that things are really going sideways versus right. when things are going phenomenal. So COVID was a testing period for us. We kind of reset a lot of our approaches on who do we choose as the right vendors when we look at PMS, CRS, CRM, et cetera. And that's where we went through those same points of saying, for the sake of a portfolio then, which was only two hotels or three hotels, we believe we could get to 10 hotels. We'll end up growing a lot more. But for that stage, we believe this was the right system and we partnered along. Then we grew more, we are like, wow, for this scale, this doesn't make sense. We got to expand a lot more. So we chose new partners and we brought a new technology. As we have learned over the years, what we have tried to adopt is what is the right solution now that even if we scale to 150, the model works. Right. And if we need to spend exactly. more money on technology, that makes sense. So we have kind of chosen those partners in place to say these are the factors we believe are long-term vested not only into their growth, but to also hear what we have to change, that what we have to say they have the ability to pivot if at all it's required, but they can be nimble and they can be really fast to act versus working with some legacy providers that you may be stuck with enough saying, yeah, this is one of the things we have added it. It will come at some point next year, right? That to us is unacceptable. So we still are on the side of finding those partners that we believe we have a voice with, that they see the value in what we are sharing. Because through our lens, how we see it as if I have the ability to make your platform better, not only does it enhance you, but it helps us being the first adopters to it. So it's a mutual win on both fronts when we take that kind of an approach. Absolutely. And growing with a company is so important, especially like on the technology side, right? Especially yeah. as you're talking about growing a portfolio, you need that technology that can grow with you. So you don't have to replace it, you know, in two, three years <laughs> once, once you're reaching that size. Yeah. So yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, and Steve, like you work with Stay in Touch. You saw how we grew our relationship there with Stay in Touch. And not to say that there are no other good vendors that may be better or not be better to stay in touch, but it's the partnership that we have in Exactly. Facebook. And what do they have the ability to do? And are they listening to us when we run into roadblocks? Or are they listening to us when we run into issues? And do they have the ability to resolve it? Right? So that's how we see it. And, and those are the ways that we chose that who is the right partner that we need for call centers. And we landed up going with Navis that we believe, sure. even though you may see it as an expensive platform, to us, it makes sense. When we looked at it for our CRM, we decided to go with Revenate for the same reason, that they were vested equally like us, not only to enhance their technologies, but also sync up a lot of different data that sits in so many different buckets. So that's how we kind of forced our partnerships together for each of them to say, this is what we believe could be for the next one year, the next two years, this makes yep. sense, but nothing beyond the scope of one year or two years because practicalities change, market change, yeah. leadership changes, and that can pivot. So we kind of keep everything to a clause of one or two years. Exactly, exactly. And I don't want to go off too much of a tangent here, but it's so funny when I came to Stay Flexi, I was talking to our leadership team and I'm like, the one thing that I really want to do is be an enjoyable team to work with, right? Because nobody enjoys changing a PMS. It's not a fun thing to do, right? Well, so if we can make that process easier and you know make it quicker, 
cheaper, faster. You know, that's all we need to do is just be enjoyable to work with. So that's kind of one of our goals here, but I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent. But what, one last question I got to ask you, how do you think the metaverse is going to affect hospitality? If anyone gives you the right answer, I would probably, <laughs> or even, like if anyone gives you an answer with a straight face, it's probably bluffing, right? But what I would say is we are probably good five or 10 years away, at least to my mind, from really capitalizing on that front and really seeing it. I think it's good to follow trends. I think it's good sure. to see what's happening. It's good to be involved to understand. So you're a little ahead mm-hmm. of the game. But if someone says you need to open this or do something, I would probably err on the side of caution because to me, it is more of a student's hat at this stage of just learning and absorbing as much. Yeah. So before we wrap up, because we are at the end, I have to, as a ex New York City general manager, pay you respect for the tie (laughs) because I wore a tie for many, many years. I had one guy on a flight from New York to Los Angeles. He said, I'm very impressed. You flew the whole flight with a tie on. He's like, how did you do that? I'm like, I'm a GM. I used to sleep with my tie on, you know? (laughs) But anyway, so we're, we're, we've wrapped it up. We really appreciate all your time. This is where we give you a chance. Tell us about EOS. Tell us what's going on. Tell us if you have any properties opening, plug away. Tell us you know, what we should be looking for next from you guys. Sure. Thank you, David. And I'll tell you about the tie situation. I hated wearing ties being in New York, especially from being an intern to growing and going to Macy's each time and trying to find the stuff on stage. <laughs> if you're making like yeah. 15 bucks an hour, you can't afford anything. And now, and then you move to the West Coast and no one wears a tie there. Like everyone's in a jacket or a hoodie. Yep. And you suddenly start to miss the tie. And 10 years later, you move back to New York and you see no one's wearing it. You kind of say like, yes. I'm going old school here, right? So <laughs> That's why I said respect. I respect the tie. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Like I think from the EO side, I'll just say that working at EOS is incredibly exciting. We have the industry rock stars at our talent pool. It's a disciplined approach within revenue as we study the market behaviors, flesh out new opportunities, and also we get a chance to double down. We have rolled out a lot of new initiatives at EOS. We have rolled out paid parental leave for all of our full-time employees that have worked with us at least for a year, and that's about 10 weeks. Our corporate offices, we have unlimited PTO, and we actually encourage people to take it. The entire month of August in our New York office is work from home. And so as we try to work through it, like we are really trying to create a culture that is different, but also at the same time, really holding the true disciplined approach of accountability. As we shared, we hold our GMs also as a CEOs for their hotels with corporate office on like the EOS corporate really being the supporting foundation. Thank you so much. Uh, That concludes another episode of The Modern Hotelier presented by Stay Flexi. GB, we appreciate you and we thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, David. Thank you, GB. You made it to the end of The Modern Hotelier. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe below. The Modern Hotelier is produced by Make More Media and presented by Stay Flexi. Stay Flexi is your modern operating system for independent hotels. If you'd like to learn more, feel free to go to stayflexi.com or if you'd rather talk to me, message me on LinkedIn or shoot me an email at steve.caron at stayflexi.com. Thanks and have a great day.